Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Super glad that you are here to be with us. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Nick. I'm the student minister here. Um, our, our guy that usually preaches is, is out of town, and, uh, but we're super glad that you are here. If you're online with us, we're glad that you've joined us today also. Thank you so much to so many of you guys that came to join us last week at our outdoor service. I dare somebody, anybody want to complain about the air conditioning this week? Anybody too chilly? Right, so we had perfect weather. Um, by, by the time it got hot, people were heading for, uh, heading for the shade. So this week I want to fill in a gap. Over the past four weeks, Grady has been talking a series called The Idols of the Heart that has been a bit provocative because there are so many things that compete for all of our hearts and all of our attention. And so he's out this week, so I'm going to be filling in. But I ask you, as we move past this week into next week, next week Grady is going to be beginning a brand new series that if you've watched the news, if you've been aware, uh, a series that is going to be very challenging, a series that's going to be very timely, a series that we're called Bridging the Gap. As we ask the question as, as believers, as followers of Jesus, how do we respond to racial issues in our country, to racial reconciliation? And so I ask you this week, I don't know if you do this very often, um, this is not a conversation that we have in these spaces very often. They tend to be pushed down for something a little bit lighter. And so this week, as you spend time in prayer, I ask that you would pray for Grady as he preps for these. I just texted him last night and said, hey, are you good for me to sort of promo this series coming next week? He said, yes, if you would. If you would ask people to pray for me and ask the invitation of the Holy Spirit. So over the next three or four weeks, as we jump into this conversation, if you could be mindful for him as he, as he leads this, um, that, we, that he would be prepared, but also that we would have open hearts as we navigate in a very, very difficult culture right now. Um, as we ask the question, what does it mean to follow Jesus and have answers to these questions? And so this morning, I want us to have just a one-week series or a one-week sermon called Fighting for More. On April 11th, 1970, some of you guys may remember this. Um, I've read about it. I've watched movies about it. Apollo 13, which was the seventh crewed mission of the Apollo series, it was the third mission that was supposed to land on the moon. Two days into the mission, an oxygen tank aboard Apollo 13 explodes, and we get this common phrase that all, very often we say today, okay, Houston, we have a problem here. And so Tom Hanks, several years ago, recreated this movie, and it was a, a, um, a blockbuster movie. And so as we move past Hollywood, I would say that, let's back up, I would say that here in today's culture is that we have a problem. And so it doesn't take long for us to watch the news or to, to, to just be alive, to realize that this is an incredibly challenging, difficult season that we're in. It's been a tough year, and yet one of the things that plagues us so much is not a new problem, but really it's an old problem that coronavirus has sped up very, very rapidly. Is that so many of us, we find ourselves to be isolated. And though, even though we're, we're, we're in a crowd this morning, it feels very different than it ever has before. Though we feel disconnected, though we feel alone. And one of the things that Scripture will teach us from the very beginning of, of as we open up the text is that even in the beginning, after God creates Adam, and God and Adam are there in creation, and, and everything is flawless, even as God appears that everything is the way it intended to be, God's heart says, but this isn't the way it was supposed to be. Men were not supposed to be connected to me alone, and Adam needs somebody else with him. And so very often we, we as in our culture, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, is that there's a move in our culture that says, you know, it's me and Jesus and everything is fine, but yet from the beginning of Scripture, we were always meant to share life and community because people make us better. And I'm so thankful that over the years that I've had people in my life that have opened up my mindset because if, if all the thoughts I had were my thoughts, it's going to be a pretty dull life. I'm going to be a pretty dull thinker. I'm going to be a pretty dull human being. And yet this idea that we live life and we live faith and community and that our relationships sharpen each other and we make each other better has been really, really difficult 
in this season, even to just be in each other's presence, much, lever, much, much less to be vulnerable, much less to be honest, much less to have honest dialogue, and even much less to really, really talk about faith and what does it mean for me to follow Jesus. Back in March, when churches all across the country began to shut their buildings, there was almost a crisis of faith. The how in the world are we supposed to follow? How in the world am I supposed to grow if I can't even go to church? What happens in this space is valuable, and what happens in this space is sacred. But I'm going to guess that you have no idea what was talked about three weeks ago. But I think the beauty of being in this place is the person sitting on your right and the person sitting on your left. And I'm fully convinced that even though Jesus came and he gave his life for the church, is that God is big enough that he doesn't need us to sit in this space this morning and sing a few songs to him, that he can probably, he's okay without our praise. But the beauty of the church was always about each other. And so this morning, I want us to push us down a road that in this season, the, the idea of being connected in community to develop our faith is not going to be an easy path and that we're going to have to fight for more. I ran across this quote this week that says, as soon as the move of God needs a building, we are in trouble. And that even though we're meeting, it doesn't feel like it used to. Conversations don't flow and we don't hang out in the aisle for an hour after church. Right? We, do, we don't embrace each other the way that we used to, and I'm okay with that. But I think in this season, it's going to require for us to dig in and to fight for human connection, maybe in a way that we never have before. And so even though churches have been closed or churches have been limited, God is still on the move. Over the past six months, I've talked to families that are thriving like they've never before. Families that for maybe years had said, you know, work is way too busy and ball schedules are way too much and our family are just fractured. And the coronavirus provided a way for families to reconnect. And so while some families have, have struggled, some families have thrived and God is on the move. I've watched our teenagers this summer as new relationships have been formed, even though our Scheduling looked drastically different, even though what we did was a tenth of what we always do. God was still on the move, and new things happened. I've watched as our students have grown in their faith in some ways. I had the privilege of re-watching a recording of three of our teenage girls the other night that led our ladies' class. And so while they're 16, 17, or 18 years old, the things that they shared, um, I told them in class the other night, is that even in your youth, is that you still have the ability to teach older women. The things that they've learned and the things that they've taken on and the optimism and how they've filled the gaps of their time. That, that whatever your perspective is, the students, that all they want to do is that they're selfish and that they just binge on Netflix. Uh, I've got three girls here that that's not the case. They've worked harder than they've ever before. They're growing in their leadership like never before. They've re-energized their commitment to scripture like never before. God is on the move. I've seen people here that are serving like never before. I think one of the coolest stories over this coronavirus is one of our older members here, Miss Yolanda Bethel, sewed over 3,000 masks for people to wear in her downtime. Right, fairly simple, but what a cool story. Right, what a cool story to take my time and to take my gift. Uh, in our house, we tried to sew some masks. They wouldn't fit anybody, right? Like we are not sewers in our house. And yet Yolanda Bethel, in her simplicity and her isolation of sitting in her living room, said, hey, this is a great window for me to serve and to make a difference and to help curb this virus. And so I want us to know that even though things are different, that God is still very much alive, and that our difficulties here don't squelch him, that there's still something more for us than living in this in-between and in this difficulty but I think it's going to require for us to connect with some people, and we're just going to have to fight for more. This morning, if you want to open your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, which Doug just read to us. The idea of the book of Hebrews, I spend most of my time teaching middle school and high school students, so we try to keep everything simple, is that the, the, the heart of the book of Hebrews is this. 
is that Jesus is the best thing going. Don't give up on him and help others do the same. Jesus is the best thing going. Make sure you don't give up on him and help other people do the same. And so this morning, I want us to work through the text real quick, and then we'll wrap that up and put it in your lap, something that you can chew on and take home. So in verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, profess for he who promised is faithful. I'm going to be honest with you that over the past six months, I've probably talked about Jesus less than I have in the past 10 years. I've been in a lot of conversation with people, but most of it has not been about spiritual formation. Most of it has not been about the move of God. Most of it has not been about where my faith is and where I'm struggling and how I'm going to grow. I've had a lot of conversations about the stock market and that wealth is lost and wealth is being regained. I've had a lot of conversations about productivity in the workplace as, we, as the world began to move to people working mobily and there was a, a, a rebuttal against that, that people can't be productive at home and yet we're finding that people can be crazy productive at home and that workplaces are still going well and people found the workflow and they've got a new space and I've had a lot of those conversations. I've had a lot of conversations, how do we do church in the middle of a pandemic? I've had lots of meetings about how do we keep you guys safe and how do we play a safe route knowing that some of you guys feel very different about that. I've had conversations about at what point in time do we reboost Kid Minute. I've had conversations about how do we do student ministry in some way and yet keep students safe but yet engage their hearts for the gospel. I've had a lot of conversations about vaccines and where does this end. I've had a lot of conversations about college football and whether we should play or we shouldn't play. And I've had a lot of conversations about when all this is going to end. But one of the things I haven't had a lot of conversations is what is God doing in my life and in your life and how do we grow? And I believe that coronavirus is way more than an inconvenience, but I feel like right in the middle of this that you and I are in a spiritual battle. A spiritual battle for what is going to be our hope. What is going to be the hope that we profess? What are we going to hold on to unswervingly? The heart of the Hebrew writer says, here's what you hold on to. Here's the hope, is that Jesus is the best thing going. Let's hold on to that. And I've got some work to do there. In verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. This idea that in the middle of my profession is that I'm asked to be relational and that when my life crosses paths with your life, that I make your life better and I help you find and follow Jesus better than you've ever before. And that you do the same for me. This idea of people intermingling with intentionality. And as Charlie mentioned in the meeting this morning, this, this passage from Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, and it's really hard to sharpen each other when we're six feet away from each other, right? It's just difficult. And that's why I call us this morning this idea of, of fighting for more. And yet the heart of this Hebrew writer is to say, but, but we're in this together to make each other better and sharper and richer and deeper than ever before. And not giving up meeting together I need you listening whether you're here or whether you're online. This is not about your guilt, okay? Some of you guys are at home watching online. That's exactly the place that you need to be. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. This was our favorite passage when we were in middle school. I grew up on the King James. And so this idea of being a forsaker, right? And so if your friends skip church... You would walk in church on Wednesday night and say, hey, Forsaker, right? And it, like, this, was, this was our scorecard, right? You come to church or you don't come to church. You're guilty if you don't, and God loves you if you do, right? Incredibly bad 13-year-old theology. But that was our word for people that didn't make it to church very often. But here's the thing I want us to see is that there's more going on here. That so often our win is to be in the space. I think as we look at this passage, there's two things going on. There's the form, there's the, the model that God set up, but then the really, really important part of this is not the form, not being present, but it's the function of what happens when we're in this space. Two very different things. 
The form is for us to gather. Don't give up being together. Don't, be a, don't give up being in relationship. Don't give up being intentional. Don't give up being sharpening each other. Don't give that up. Don't miss out on that. And the function of our gathering is to help us to grow. But here's what I know. These are independent of each other. Is that we have the ability to be in this space for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And yet we're never in community. Yet we're never really in a relationship that makes anyone better. Or maybe there's people in my life that I sit next door to every single week, but we can miss out on the idea of relational faith even though we're in the same physical space. And yet the Hebrew writer here is saying, gather, be together, but this is about more. This is about being connected with people more than ever before. As I mentioned earlier, there's several good things that have happened, more time with family, and we've, I've learned a lot about video and photography. From one Sunday, we had live church, and then all of a sudden, church is canceled. We say, how are we going to do this? And I spent about the next 60 hours on YouTube figuring out how do I take my camera and shoot a video and put this on the Internet for people to see. We've had time to fix things around the church and to be physically healthier maybe than I have been in a long time. But there's something about all of that that makes me still hungry for more. For all the things that the season has provided, there's still something in my gut that says that's not the good stuff. There's still something in my, more, in my, in my gut that says I'm a little bit lonely, not for just people around me, but I'm lonely for people to sit down and have a rich dialogue about what does it mean for me to follow Jesus right now. And I don't want to be satisfied with just where we're at. And that for the next 15 seconds, I want you to lean over to your neighbor and share with them your top go-to snack. Right? So you've got the pantry, you've got that bowl, you've got that place in your house that you leave your guilty pleasures. Right? So in 15 seconds, lean over to your neighbor, share with them your guilty pleasure, your snack, the thing that you go to at 3.30 in the afternoon. Y'all pretty passionate about your snacks in the afternoon, I can tell. All right, a little, little bit of volume there. Love that. So I, I did a quick, I'm go, we're, we're headed somewhere. Uh, did, just did a quick Google search. Everybody's got their list. Um, most of them are wrong. But at least one top 25 snacks of America, maybe they judge this by sales. Um, number one top snack in America is M&M's. Raise your hand if you're an M&M go-to. Right? Uh, it's like, the thing I love about M&M's is you have to eat a lot before anybody notices that you took some, right? Um, it, it was funny. Todd and Sally are here today, and several months ago, weeks ago, we went to their house and, and cat set, I guess, um, fed their cats and watered their plants, and my girls ate all of your M&M's that were on the counter. I just want to let you know, public perfect confession on their part. Uh, number one, M&M's. Number two, Hershey bars. Anybody her just chocolate fans in general? All right, Costco has these uh, dark chocolate sea salt caramel things. Man alive, you'll thank me. Go get some. Um, number three, Reese's Cups. Right, there we go, peanut butter and chocolate. Um, good, uh, good argument of the goodness of God right there, those two. Um, I don't know who these people are. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, just, I just don't know... Who, on a, on a whim, says, you know what, I am dying for some soggy oats in my bowl. Let's heat it up and add a plop of butter. Anybody go to Quaker Oats? Oh, bless it. Right, it, it just not there. My mom tried to feed these to me when I was a kid. We had no other food. Uh, wheat man, maple syrup, butter, sugar, it, it doesn't matter. You can't save oats. Um, number five is Ritz crackers. Right, some cream cheese and habanero pepper jelly on top of that, right? It's good stuff. Um, here's my favorite, fudge rounds, right? I grew up in Tennessee. We're pretty simple down there. Uh, anybody, anybody a little Debbie fan? Right, that's where it's at. 
So when I used to work in Kentucky, it was um, a lot of times I eat really unhealthy. I re- eat like a bunch of junk for lunch, and then about 3.30 you get this uh, blood sugar issue, and you're like, you're starving, Marvin. And so it was one of those days about 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, and I am scrounging the church building like a mouse, trying to find something. And I walk into our church kitchen, and this angelic music began from heaven. And there is a whole box of fudge rounds that somebody had a sticker on top, said, do not use this. This is for ladies' Bible class. But I can't read. <laughs> so I thought if they knew, it's like the consecrated bread of the temple. If you knew how hungry I was, like you would be okay with this. And so I break open the box, and I get a fudge round. Um, we're, it's like just, a, just an inhale. And I'm like, oh, that was exceptional. And then after seven more of them, I emptied the entire box of fudge round. You know you ate too much when you take the trash and you put it in the trash can, but under the rest of the trash, so nobody knows, right? You, some of you guys have been there with me. And so, like, for a moment, for a moment, I was so satisfied for a moment but then it crashed but then it crashed and I say that to say this that that in the season there are lots of things that we can fill our hearts with that we can use to take up our time and our interest and I love 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 for the people that have learned new new things or the Dixons have painted their kitchen cabinets or you've traveled more or you've walked more I, I love those things and I'm thankful that like you haven't just been on Netflix or Amazon Prime for the past six months. I love that we fill our life with things that have value. But there's more. Right? I think in some ways that those are sort of like a box of fudge rounds that for a moment they satisfy. But I think at the very heart of who we are, there's this desire to be known by people and to be known by God and to know people and to know God. And this hunger just keeps coming back up, says, fill me with the only thing that can fill me up, and that's Jesus Christ and people who want to follow him. And I keep coming back to that place. And so we find ourselves here in a little bit of an isolated culture, and yet we can look and say, well, 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 it's all about COVID. But this morning I want us to think about, I believe this has been coming for a couple hundred years anyways, and this was just the icing on the cake. The reasons of isolation are complex, but the story we weave is simple. The ties that bind us have come unwound in the face of enormous change. Michael Hendricks, an article called Lonely America. If we back up to the Gospels, first century, and we see people that choose to follow Jesus, and you, you read like in the end of Acts chapter 2 where the people, they, they gather. It's a very simple gathering. They gather in each other's homes and they share a meal and they pray together. And this, this really intimate connection, maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 people, they gather in the name of Jesus. And there's just so much goodness that happens there. And so for 12, 13, 14, 1500 years, this is the model. Until around 1500, Constantine comes and says, you know, this whole Jesus thing is a pretty good deal. Let's start building church buildings so people can gather. And you guys know the difference, right? I was in a meeting this morning about life groups. Following Jesus in relationship is totally different at my kitchen table than it is sitting in a pew. It's conversational. It's give and take. And so around 1,500 people began to leave their homes and they began to move into church buildings and the numbers grew and they grew and the level of intimacy and connection began to decline unless people fought for more and said, no, still come into my home, we're still missing something. In the 1900s, we began this move to go even further where the world moved from an agricultural community into an industrial community that used to, it was the families on the farms and neighbors helped each other and now we're getting into our cars and we're driving to the factory. And we lose this sense of community and we become even more isolated and more individual than we ever have before. Around 2000, at least the theorists say that we left this modern mindset and we began to move into what is referred to as post-modernity. A quote here that this tide of autonomy is washing over the shoals of society, these who shrug at faith, especially the middle-aged mainliners, that's me, 
and the unaffiliated millennials are simply going their own way rather than gathering in community. And so I, you know, I hear us talk about these people, right, that it's me and God, it's me and Jesus, and I don't really need the church, and we find that a little bit frustrating, that I'm going to follow Jesus on my own, right, I don't really need anybody else, and that's a point of contention for some of us, and yet I get it and I understand it. And we have set loose a scourge of loneliness and isolation that we are still afraid to acknowledge as the distinct social dysfunction of our age and individualism. If you reach into your purse or to your back pocket, most of you have a smart device that has created even more isolation than ever before. Is that somewhere along the way we believe the lie that a phone call is the same thing as a cup of coffee? Or a text message is the same thing as a hug? Or that a FaceTime is the same thing as being in somebody's presence? Dr. Henry Cloud said that there are things that happen incarnationally that can never happen digitally, and yet um, we, we live our lives on these things, and it's a great way to connect. But if you're a grandparent, you can FaceTime your kid in Calif- your grandchild in California, or if I gave the option, would you rather them be in your living room in your lap? They're two to- they're, I'm with you. They're two totally different stories, and yet we live in this culture that, that while they're not evil, Right, I love mine. Please don't take it away from me. Again, it drives this idea of being isolated that we're really missing valuable connection. And so you'd couple all two or three or four of those in addition to coronavirus and says, okay, now everybody stay at home. Everybody wear a mask. Everybody be six feet apart from each other. It's driven us to a place of incredible loneliness and disconnection that I think has implications on our faith. I want to ask you three questions that I ask myself all the time. I don't like the questions, and you're not going to like the questions either because they're a little bit offensive. And right now I don't have great answers to any of them, just to be transparent. And yet I believe as a young man who tries to follow Jesus Christ and to help people find and follow Jesus in addition that these are three most important questions that I'll ever ask, that I will ever attempt to live into, because I believe that my faith is not my faith alone. That my faith was given to me by a host of people that came before me, with a movement of God in the middle of that, and I feel obligated that my faith make an impact on the people's lives around me. Several years ago, <clears throat> Meredith and I did a family retreat here, And we had an answer to this question. I got off track. Let's go. First question is this. Who are you currently learning from? Who are you learning from in the past six months? At whose feet have you been sitting at? At whose table have you been at to learn how to follow Jesus better than ever before? I mentioned the family retreat we did. We, we talk about the importance of this, of having people have bigger, richer, deeper faith in us and spending time with them so that our faith can be shaped. And very quickly, Meredith and I made a list of 20, 30, 40 adults that in adolescence and college that we sat at their feet, we sat on their couches, we sat in their living rooms, and they showed us what it means to follow Jesus. We had the privilege of serving overseas with elders, and with other adults. We had parents in the youth group that that would invite to their house and we got a glimpse of what a great marriage looked like. We got a great glimpse of what um, conflict resolution looked like. We got a great glimpse of what it means to study scripture, of what it meant to be prayerful, of how it meant to to serve in a local church. And, And growing up, we had all of these teachers that at the time, they were just like a volunteer, right? They didn't mean all that at the time, but man, when we hit 30, we realize we've got this bank of knowledge and goodness. But I'm going to be honest, at 45 years old, this is hard. In middle age, who am I going to learn from? It requires me to answer the question that I don't know at all. I have to be honest that my faith still needs to grow. It has, I have to be honest that maybe you're more in love with Jesus and you have more to offer me can I learn from you? It requires vulnerability. 
It requires us to ask great questions. It requires us to hear hard truths. But in the middle of this, where we're distanced, who are you currently learning from? The next question, who are you learning with? Who currently are you side by side with that's sort of on your same journey that you're rubbing shoulders with and you're sharpening, you're asking really good questions, but you're sort of co-partners in the middle of this seeking faith development? Who are you learning with? And then the third question, who is learning from you? Then maybe you're in a position then maybe you've got a little bit more Jesus under your belt. Maybe you've got a few more answers. Maybe you've got a little bit deeper faith. Now, who are you dragging along with you saying, hey, here's how it's done. Here's how we do this dance. This is what it feels like. This is what it looks like. Here's how you answer the tough question. But it puts me right in the middle of three different relationships, all for the purpose of either having my faith grown or taking my faith and passing it on. But this... These are hard questions in the middle of this. And I don't like my answers right now. And it leaves me hungry that there's something more, there's something better, there's something richer. And in some ways, in some ways, able to pull off an outdoor church service, if I don't have good answers to these questions, I'm missing out. They were able to keep you guys safe and were able to gather here today. If I don't have good answers to these three questions, I'm missing out. Because in the middle of this, I still have a responsibility to follow Jesus and to grow in that commitment, to grow in that faith, and to grow in that dependency. And so my scorecard has to change, and I've got to figure out what my answers to these questions are. Who am I learning from? Who am I learning with? And who is learning from me? And so this morning, maybe you look at those questions and you're like, please don't call on me and ask my answers because I don't have any. I haven't learned from anybody in a long time. I don't really have a partner in faith, and I'm really in no position to be passing on my faith. Again, this is not about guilt. This is about saying, hey, could you put it on your radar screen? Because this is at the heart of discipleship. Right, if you want to go to Matthew chapter 28, this idea of this, this great commission is what we call it, that Jesus, as he ends his ministry... He says, I want you to go and I want you to engage people for the sake of the gospel. That's the very heart of what this is about. And if I don't have great answers to those questions, I'm missing out on the mission. Our local church mission, Love, Grow, Share, all of that is relational. And if I don't have great, question, great answers to those questions, I might be missing out on the very mission. And of all the things I don't want to miss, I don't want to miss what God's doing. In me and in other people, I want to be in the middle of it. So i got to answer these questions. And so maybe this morning I just put those on your radar screen. If you're like, ah, I, I'm 0 for 3. I, I don't really have an answer to any of those. Just make a note and to begin to fight for more. So this morning, in just a few minutes, I want us to have three simple takeaways that we can... Um, you can put in your back pocket and take with you of, of how, do we, how do we engage in this. The first thing is to make some lemonade. Um, I went round and round about what I wanted to call this, but I've been perplexed as I've watched people's response to this difficult season. This season has crushed some of us, and there are some people that have thrived in the middle of it. Right? It just stinks, Right? Doing church like this just stinks. There's nothing good about it. I don't like it. I don't love it. It is what it is, right? I could choose to be angry, or I could choose to make it better, right? I, I, I could choose to disconnect and to lose trust with everybody, or I can use this season to connect. And whatever we do in this season, you're not a victim. There's a whole globe right now in the same situation you are. What do we do with it? Maybe you do have enough, a little bit more time. Maybe you got a little bit more time for a few more cups of coffee with somebody on your back porch. You got a, you got a little bit more space, right? We could bemoan where we're at in culture. 
We can look at it and we can be disenfranchised and we can worry about where this is going to end or we can jump up in the middle of it and we can make some lemonade in the middle of a season that really, really is difficult and really, really stinks all the way around. And I've tried my best to peg the difference between how people respond to difficulty or tragedy. It's attitude, it's perspective, it's mindset. I think it's a condition of our heart. I think there are a lot of things that go into it. And so for the next few minutes, the world's not going to shift drastically. We're going to be here for a hot minute. And so what are you going to do with it? Continue to criticize, continue to complain, to continue to be frustrated, or say, you know, it is what it is. How do we step in the middle of it and make this a little bit better. One thing I talk about a lot with our students is the idea of confirmation bias. The reward for negativity is more negativity. You always see more of what you stare at. Pastor Levi Lesko. If you spend more time on Facebook, chances are your attitude and perspective is not going to change. If you watch more news, chances are your attitude and perspective are not going to change. If you want to devour Twitter every day and read all of the news feeds, chances are your attitude and perspective are not going to change. You will see more of what you stare at. And so maybe this is a season that we spend more time staring at friendly faces across a kitchen table. Or maybe I spend more time staring at the goodness of God in Scripture. Or maybe I spend more time looking into the face of a poor person as I serve them because I will find what I'm looking for. And there are some avenues that we're not going to find any goodness or anything that fills your heart. Number two, kick apathy in the teeth. Um, it's a little bit violent, but I think apathy will, will, will destroy us faster than just about anything. I love to sit in my recliner, and I love to take it easy, and I love to watch fishing shows on YouTube, right? I love all of that, and there are some days that... Be honest with you, that's all I wanted to do. But yet, I, I've, I've got to, I've got to man up and just kick that attitude and that spirit right in the face. That that I, I, I am made for way more. I am made. God has crafted me for way more than YouTube. I mean, God has given me and he's given you giftedness. He's given us hands. He's given us voices. He's given us compassion. He's given us mercy. And to live this season in apathy saying, ah, oh, I just don't want to move. I just want to sit here. I just, ah. Oh. I'm telling you, there's a spiritual battle over your life in that moment. Will you use the things that God gave you and gifted you to make a difference? Or will you stay in the easy chair? And it's going to require a little bit of passion, a little bit of anger to get up out of the chair and say, I refuse to believe the lie that this is the best that it can get. And then we go out and we make something happen. And the last thing that will be done is this is a season we're just going to have to fight for more. There are some seasons where faith comes easy. We have opportunities and life is just... Um, it just flows and relationships are easy and the weather is nice and all these things happen. This is not where we're at. It's going to require a little bit of fight. A couple crazy simple things. This afternoon, Rob and Doug have provided a space on the back porch just to watch a Reds game and eat peanuts. There's probably not going to be a lot of spiritual formation that takes place out there. I'm just going to say. But it might be the first human conversation that you've had in a long time just as a beginning place right just as a baseline beginning place to connect with somebody and to do something lighthearted. this morning Kurt led us in a meeting about life groups that are coming up and they are all over the map right some of us are saying hey I'm virtual only some of them say I want to go outside inside with a mask inside no mask right it's complicated it's not easy there's a lot of good people that are in the same place you are trying to gather at some level to have some conversation about something that matters. It's better than binging on YouTube. It's a beginning place. Maybe your fight is to call that friend and say, hey, could we get together this week? 
I'll stand 12 feet away from you, but I, I just need to talk. As much as we can, let's move away from the digital, right? If you're at home and you have high health risk, man, stay digital. That's your first, that's your first, uh, your first go-to. But the best that we can is to connect with real life people and to develop trust and to develop vulnerability and honesty to talk about our faith, to talk about Jesus Christ, to talk about the move of God, to talk about the things that are going on to make our lives and our hearts richer than ever before. I don't know when the end date is, of this is. <clears throat> it's not next week. And so we've got some choices to make of whether we stay where we're at, maybe in our unhealthiness, maybe in our frustration and our disappointment and our angst, or maybe we step in the middle of it and we fight to make it better and we fight for something more. As one of the leaders of this church, all that we want, I want for myself, I want it for you, I want it for my kids, I want it for my house, is how do I follow Jesus in a rich, vibrant way? That's what this life is really all about. And so this morning we invite you to fight for more. As we wrap up, as the season moves, if you find yourself in difficult situations, especially when it comes to faith or when it comes to emotional or mental health, I ask that you would ask that you would reach out in the middle of that. That there, there is a great lie going on that says you, you are all alone that I don't believe is true. That there are lots of people around you that love you, that care for you, willing to bless you and help you walk through a difficult moment. And so as we finish this morning, I just ask that we fight for more. Fight for something richer. Fight for something better. And have Jesus Christ at the middle of all of that. So we're going to sing a song, and then we'll have communion. Jesus.